Welcome everybody. In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of unsupervised classification in remote sensing. So again, the goal with classification is to go from an image, which is essentially a grid of numbers, and assign each pixel into some class that we might use to make a meaningful map. So in this video, we're going to talk about how we can visualize each pixel in a raster or each pixel in an image basically as a list of numbers. And then we can use different algorithms to differentiate and classify those lists of numbers as either similar or different from each other. So we'll talk specifically about the k-means algorithm, ISO data, and then touch on spectral angle classification. So there's two types of classes in classification. User classes are uh, defined by the user. These are functional surface types like burned, unburned, water, rock, things like that. Those are things we're familiar with. That's different than spectral classes, which are simply groups of pixels that are similar to each other mathematically, whether it's meaningful or not. So we just had a video on supervised classification, where we provide the computer with training data, and it divides the image into user classes. Right? In this video, we're going to touch on unsupervised classification, in which we essentially do not provide any information to the computer at all. We don't tell it what user classes we're hoping to get. We just let the computer divide the image into spectral classes, basically assign each pixel into a group with pixels that are similar to it. We, we can uh, tweak a little bit what we mean by similar but uh, and how many classes we might want, but we don't tell it um, any a priori information about what those classes look like spectrally. So again, unsupervised classification, no training stage, going right into spectral classes, and typically the user will then um, assign the spectral classes into user classes at the end. Okay, so we'll say this, this class one actually is grass, or class one and two are both grass. Um, so why might we use unsupervised classification? Well, lots of reasons. Maybe you're unfamiliar with the area. You don't even know uh, what the user classes might be. Or maybe there's lots of subclasses that are hard to discern. And you want to understand that, oh yeah, there's actually like four types of grass here. And you want to kind of capture those into spectral classes and then aggregate them at the end. Or maybe you have a large number of spectral bands where you want to really make sure you you get all the leverage that you can. <clears throat> so before we think about how these algorithms work, we need to understand something, which is that um, although, yes, a pixel is a pixel in an image or in a map, it's something you can see, a pixel is also really uh, a list of numbers, right? In a, especially in a multi-band raster image. So, right, so here's our multi-band raster, and we have bands 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So these are pictures of the same thing. Five pictures of the exact same extent, exact same pixels, but each collected in a different wavelength of light. So if you ask, what's the value of a pixel? Well, you actually have five different values. You have one value for each band, right? And so essentially we can think of these pixels as being a list of numbers, also called mathematically called a vector, right? Each pixel has a signature which is basically a list of five numbers. And so the, the game we're playing here is to take, is to mathematically try to group these, these lists of numbers into lists that are similar or lists that are different. So the way we often do this as simple-minded humans is we might plot one number against the other. So um, these are called uh, scatter plots. And it's very common in classification software that you'll see these, right? So here's all the pixels in the image, or maybe it's, yeah, let's say it's all the pixels in the image plotted as band one versus band seven. Okay, here's all those same exact pixels plotted as band two versus band three. And so you can start to see that um, some bands have a high degree of covariance. So here, for any given pixel, if it's high in band 2, it's also high in band 3. If it's low in 2, it's also low in 3. So what that means is that it's actually hard to use um, bands 2 and 3 
to uh, distinguish the pixels from, into groups, right? They don't give you any leverage. Um, in contrast, band two versus four actually gives us a lot more leverage. We start to pull some of these groups apart. But the main thing I want you to, to take away from this is as we think about these algorithms, this is how you should be thinking about the data, right? As one band plotted against another, where each kind of data point on the plot is, is a pixel that needs to be classified. So you really have to make a transformation in your head of how you're thinking about these pixels now. They're kind of in mathematical space. So our first algorithm is the k-means classification. And again, um, these are intended to be four different uh, scatter plots that you're looking at right here, okay? So there's, the axes aren't labeled, but this axis might be band one, this axis might be band two, and each of these is supposed to be a, a pixel. And each of these circles is supposed to be a mean. So the way this algorithm works is the computer specifies a number of seed classes, or the user can specify it also. But the important thing is the computer picks them randomly. So it says, all right, let's pick uh, a red group, a green group, and a blue group, or classes, right? And it says, tosses those out as hypothetical means, OK? Then it uses the minimum distance classifier to classify the pixels. So this pixel right here was closest to the red mean, so it was classified into the red group. These two pixels here were closer to green, so they were classified into the green group during that first stage. Okay, so now it's got the, it's got this kind of scatter plot space gridded out into classes, right? Anything that falls up here is going to be in red class. Anything that falls over here is going to be in blue class. But remember, this is just based on arbitrary seed values. So the next thing to do is actually it, it recomputes the mean. So it computes the mean of green class, okay? And it went from here to here. So that mean shifts a little bit, right? Same with blue, it shifts. Red only had one pixel, so red shifted a lot, jumped all the way over to here. And then it repeats. It does another minimum distance classifier, and now it's got a different result, right? These two that were green are now actually classified as red, um, and the green group has fewer pixels belonging to it. So you can see that it's, uh, it's iterating. And it's essentially, as it does this, these means are going to start encroaching closer and closer to the center of pixel groups, right? And that's the point. And then once there's no change, once the, the new mean that's computed after a cycle is the same as the previous cycle, then uh, the algorithm is complete, and it has uh, classified the image. So that's how the k-means classification work. Again, it's unsupervised. We didn't give any classes, bef class information beforehand. We just let the computer uh, move these means around, binning and rebinning the pixels until, until it's stabilized. OK, so there's another common algorithm called the isodata algorithm. It's essentially identical to the k-means algorithm, except for one thing. After each cycle, the computer or the user is able to specify if a class is too variant or if it's too small. So if a class, for example, is, has too high of a standard deviation of the pixel values, uh, it could be split okay, into two additional classes. Likewise, if a class ends up with only one pixel, right? Maybe it's an outlying pixel and somehow a mean got out there. Um, that class could be eliminated or deleted or could be clumped with a neighboring class so that you don't end up with lots of, you know, with a class for every outlying pixel, basically. So that's ISO data, and that's what we would more commonly use than k-means. It's a little bit more diverse. OK, so let's. Uh, now move towards the finish line with our third algorithm, which is spectral angle classification. So this is really different, and but again, we need to still start by making sure we understand that each pixel is represented by a list of numbers that we can plot in a scatter plot. Okay, so here 
Um, we've got uh, urban pixels plotted here, far forest pixels plotted here, and water over here, right? Each have these unique pairings of, of band values. And so uh, the basis of spectral angle is that each of these pixels can be represented by a unique vector, okay? Um, the vectors start at the origin, like a value of 0, 0, and the tip of the vector is defined by the, the pairs of pixel values. And so what we see is that uh, each pixel, or not, but most pixels, have a unique, uh, a unique vector associated with them. And so we may be able to classify based on that. So let's look at an example here. Okay, so consider we have four pixels, right? A, B, C, and D. And we plotted them in this, this bivariate space. If you were using a Euclidean distance metric, like for example, uh, minimum distance to the mean, um, they look very spread out, right? They're all kind of equally far apart. They don't seem to be clustering at all, right? But then, um, what, what spectral angle recognizes and what makes it very powerful is that A, B, and C actually fall on the same line, okay? And what that means is, and they, they all have the same, their vector all has the same angle, or the line has the same slope. Lots of ways to say this. Another way to say this is that they actually have consistent band ratios. So for A, B, and C, the ratio of band 2 over band 1 is constant. It's the same for A, B, and C. And of course, rise, band 2, over run, band 1, is slope. So the fact they have the same band ratio means they have the same slope, okay, relative to a fixed origin, um, and they fall along the same line. And so that's powerful, right? This, these could be three pixels that are the exact same thing, but just have different, uh, different levels of shadowing. Right? This could be grass in bright sun. This could be grass in the shadow. So both bands are less bright in a proportional way. So that's a huge, powerful advantage of spectral angle, right? That it essentially um, normalizes away brightness variations. And so just to formalize this, we can then see that although A, B, and C are on the same line, uh, D is on a different line, has a really different angle. And this angle alpha um, kind of quantifies the difference you know, between pixels A, C, and B, and D. So D would get classified as something else, and A, B, and C would get classified together based on the spectral angle approach. Before I forget, I'll mention this, this spectral angle can be used in either a, a supervised or an unsupervised context. So you can also do this by providing training data or not providing training data. And then in closing, I'll just say that um, although we can only visualize these vectors in a maximum of three-dimensional space, like this cube shown here, um, we can mathematically define a vector in however many dimensions we want. So if you have seven bands, you have a seven-dimensional vector, um, and that angle is computed in that seven dimensional space. So you get the full leverage of all of the bands. So in summary, uh, unsupervised classification divides images into spectral classes as opposed to user classes, right? It just breaks the pixels into groups that are similar to each other based on their spectral signature. It's important that when we think about this, we visualize each pixel as basically a list of band values that can be plotted against each other, or this list of numbers can be compared in, in different ways mathematically. The k-means algorithm basically seeds random class means, classifies the image, computes new means, and just repeats that until there's no change. The isodata algorithm is very similar to k-means, but the user or computer can split and merge classes as it goes, and that lets you uh, prevents basically having, you know, classes associated with e each outlying data point, for example. Uh, and finally, spectral angle algorithm uh, basically defines each pixel 
as the tip of a, of a vector and then classifies the pixels based on the angle between their vectors. Thanks for listening. Hope you get to try this out in a GIS software like ArcMap or QGIS. Uh, have fun.